like to explore the Gospel of Mark. Now, why choose Mark? What is significant about Mark? Well, there is here the writings of Paul. And we know he died at 57. Here is Mark. He wrote approximately 72 or thereabouts, depending upon what authority we read. And so he fashioned a work called the Gospel of Mark. Gospel means good news. Matthew came along. And he's writing it about 10 years later. 82 to 85 or thereabouts. And he too writes a gospel. And after him comes Luke. And he's approximately uh, 87 to 90. And these are probably two minus and pluses on the dates. And then there's John that's said to be much later and he wrote his gospel, and his is 92 to plus. What is the significance of Mark? That's our problem. Well, Paul was the original writer his letter shaped Christianity. What most people call Christianity is found in Paul. Therefore, most scholars call Christianity Pauline Christianity. Now, the great theologian, Rudolf Bultmann, says that the need, there is a need to separate the myths of Christianity in order to make it a viable alternative in the modern world, in the scientific world. So he said, what we have to do is separate the myth, the mythology. Now he calls any outdated cosmology a mythology. That view of separating the mythology from Pauline Christianity is Boltman's thesis, because what you have left is the central message or the kerygma. Now, <clears throat> the whole idea that Jesus is the only Son of God that he died on the death of, a death of a sinner on a cross, that he's the only son of God, that there's a heaven and hell, and all of the customary views of Christianity are called primarily the 14 points because Boltman identifies them each in his writing on this work called Demythologizing Christianity. What's essential for us, though, is that... <clears throat> So that none of this appears in Mark. Therefore, Mark, in writing what he did, chooses to ignore Paul. Now, there are 600, problem, approximately 667, or say 670 verses in Mark. Matthew, obviously, has read Mark and studied him because <clears throat> he includes in his own work 90% of Mark. Luke also reflects on the writings of Mark and includes in his writing about 60%, just to keep it at even numbers. John follows his own course. These are therefore called the synoptic gospels. They, 
have a same source, a common source. They're called synoptic. <clears throat> now, there is some material that is found in Luke and in Matthew that is not found in Mark. That common material is called Q. And it dates approximately at 50 A.D. <clears throat> no. That means there was a body of material, some 70 verses, approximately 70 verses, makes up Q. <clears throat> and Mark ignored it. He didn't include it. So usually the question you ask is, why did Mark ignore Q, and why does he ignore Paul? I would like to explore that a little further. Because there's something going on in Mark that is very significant. Now, when you talk about the Gospel of Mark, we must talk about a reliable text of Mark. Well, in the search for the earliest Greek text, the early Greek texts, many people have been involved in this in the hundreds of years, <coughs> pardon me, they have found what is called the Codex Sinaiticus, and also there's also, Codex is the name of an ancient uh, manuscript, Codexes. There's another one called the Codex Vaticanitis because was discovered in the Vatican. The Vatican didn't know they had an ancient copy until someone went in there and discovered it in 1475. So, I would like to talk tonight <coughs> about this strange Greek text called the Gospel of Mark and from the monastery in Sinai, which is why they call it the Codex Sinaiticus, the source from which that Codex came from is the Sinai. Now, it's a very beautiful Bible, by the way, illuminated, and it perfectly preserved because it was in the Sinai Desert. But what's interesting is that Mark goes on for 16 chapters and ends at 20. The earliest Greek texts clearly and at 16.8. And there's evidence quite clearly from history that there's a whole argument of who added to it these famous 12 lines. Now what's significant about these 12 lines, or verses I should say, is that that is the claim of Jesus' resurrection, physical resurrection. <clears throat> that is to say, the earliest copy of Mark, not only the one in Sinai, but also the Vatican, contains no reference of the physical resurrection of Jesus. That is to say, there is no Easter. Therefore, for the first 350 or 400 years, Christians who read Mark, and were Christians because they followed Mark, did so without any reference to the resurrection. It is in Matthew and in Luke, of course. Now, <clears throat> how can you have a Christianity, how can you have a religion without a resurrection? Some theologians argue that without an Easter you can't have Christianity, but there was a Christianity, obviously, for 400 years without an Easter. Well, I want to see if I can raise this to a couple of curious issues. <clears throat> when we look at Mark just by itself, what do we find? Now, I'm going to invite everyone, of course, to look at it themselves and see whether what we say this evening can be found in the text. <clears throat> 
first. You can take Mark, just as I've shown here, and you can break it up into scenes. Let each one of these represent a particular scene with a beginning, middle, and change in scene must be clear and obvious. When you study these and compare them one against the other, you can always do something rather curious. You can see that there's an incremental development in the work, which is to say you can find in any particular episode, you can find there's always something greater in the successor than it was in the antecedent. That, that is true for miracles, that is true for interrelationships, that is true for the way Jesus deals with his disciples. You can see an incremental development. It reaches a high point in book nine, and then the danger increases, the tension increases, the drama unfolds into what is called finally the passion story. The plot begins in the early third chapter, but it reaches its high point after the ninth, and with increasing danger, brings about, finally, the crucifixion scene. Now, what else can we find about this work? Well, we can find several things that are very important, and I'd like to talk about them. There is a tension, there is a tension in the Bible, and the Gospel of Mark, and I'd like to explore it. So, let me set it out. <clears throat> this way. How are two terms being used? Belief, understanding. Another word, repent. Another word, gospel. Suppose we can show, as this story unfolds, that belief is intimately connected with miracles. The people must have belief before there can be a miracle. When Jesus finds that there isn't a certain level of belief, he says no miracle can take place. That's very clear. There's an intimate connection, therefore, between miracles and belief. However, what is the goal of the gospel? The goal of the gospel, clearly, is hidden in this term the kingdom of God. Now, it is extremely interesting that when we examine any of the cases of miracles, and when we find in those cases of the miracles that we find the people have a high level of belief, and in belief in him, that he doesn't invite them into his inner circle. He does not invite them into the inner circle, nowhere. What he wants with the inner circle and what he stresses again and again is this curious thing called understanding. Now, what kind of understanding is it? Well. Next to belief in miracles, there is understanding and parables. There is something quite artistically intriguing about this gospel. Let me see if I can represent it. 
<clears throat> from the fourth chapter, let's call these at this point the fourth chapter. From the fourth chapter on, he gives many parables. The Gospel of Mark is full of parables. They're depending upon how you link up the parables, because some parables seem to go on in a series before the complete parable is finished. But normally, they're, they're called 32 to 35, depending upon how you count, parables in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is a study of parables. Now, I'd like to add to the study that while he explores parables and trying to show how they can be understood, he also does something quite remarkable, and that is he takes a whole series of events I'm going to use the example from chapter 6, 7, and 8. He takes the whole series of things going on in 6, 7, and 8 and treats these events, he treats these events as if they are parables. <clears throat> He treats them as if they're parables. So parables are explored in terms of their significance, in terms of events. Events are, are, are explored as if they are parables. Now, in chapter 4, he's very clear about the fact that these parables are to be understood and they are to be understood by the inner circle. <clears throat> when they are understood by the inner circle, they become analogies that have an interesting significance. That is to say, the parables can be objects of understanding, and when they are understood, they are no longer parables to those who understand it, but rather they are analogies. Analogies is where you have a series of events or descriptions of things, and for each one, there is said to be something it represents. And when you have the two levels in hand, then you have a series of terms with their corresponding meanings, two levels, and that's, analog that's an analogy. I would like to point to one and show to what degree there is this strictness and the demand that this inner circle understand them. Now, it's quite important to know that for all others, all others, it must remain as parables, must remain as parables, because he has an extremely interesting point. He wants them not to understand, because if they do understand, they'll turn around, repent, and be saved. And that's what he doesn't want. The Jesus of the Gospel of Mark is not after the repentance of all sinners. That is not his goal. Let's see if we can make that clear because we want to push the implications of that. <clears throat> and that's where we're going for the moment. All right, let me quickly do it. I'm in chapter 4. Um, oh, and by the way, we have another theme on the side which we can put uh, the identity of Jesus. <clears throat> All the demons, unclean spirits, these, these are said to be able to perceive the nature of Jesus, but no one else is able to see it. 
So that's another theme, but I'd like to return to that in a few minutes. I'd like to go into the beginning now of, of Mark in chapter 4 so we can see that he has a very explicit way of exploring analogies, pardon me, parables into analogies. <clears throat> All right, now. Um, in the beginning of Mark, he explores the parable of the sower and the seed. And I'm sure we are all familiar with it. Right, a crowd gathers and he reveals this great parable of the sower and the seed. Listen, a sower went out to sow and he sowed some seed. It fell among the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where it had not much soil and immediately it sprang up and since it had no depth of soil and when the sun rose it was scorched, hence it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. It yielded no grain. And the other seeds fell into good soil, and it brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, hundredfold. Then he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those who were about him with the twelve asked him concerning the parable. And he said, to you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. For those outside, everything is in parables. They have been given the secret of the kingdom of God. That's the inner circle. And he said to them, to you it's been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. For to whom, for to him who has will more be given, and for him who has not yet even what he has will be taken away, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, they may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn again and be forgiven. He doesn't want them to be forgiven. No forgiveness. Right? If they grasp this, they'll turn around and be forgiven. That's why he wants to remain a teacher who only teaches an inner circle and blocks those outside of the circle because he doesn't want them to realize the significance of it and then seek forgiveness, which, by the way, follows from repentance. Now. This is a mystery, because he says it again and again. Now, the way he unpacks this parable is quite clear. He tells them, he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you be able to understand all the parables? If you understand the sower and the seed, if you understand this one, Right? It's like the archetype, the sower and the seeds. If you don't understand this one, how will you understand all the other parables? That is an archetypal analogy because it's in this one that he unpacks it and shows you how to understand parables. How then will you be able to understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, the logos. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown when they hear Right, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word which is sown in them. And these in like manner are the, are the ones sown upon rocky ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while, and then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And the others are the ones sown among the thorns. When they hear the word, but the cares of the world and the delight and riches and their desire for other things enter in and choke the word, it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown upon the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, hundredfold. Now, 
That's the way to do it. For each one of the symbols in, this, in the parable, right, the birds coming down, right, the seed, the sower, the, the soil, good soil, the rocks, right, the soil and th thistles, right, each one has its corresponding equivalent. And therefore, you can read the story, hear the story, learn the story, but you understand it on another level. When you understand it on another level, then you have an analogy between the two. That is what he's going to call understanding. It's an analogical understanding. It's an appreciation for how to find how the major terms in the story function in the spiritual life. And it's all concerned with what? What's the seed? The logos, the word. That's what you have to understand. Well, from this, many other parables come, and therefore if they're 32 to 35, this is an exercise in analogical understanding that plays a major role in the entire gospel. Now, we could go through many of them, but it would be, be saying the same thing. They are tasks for us to understand. They are tasks for us to understand. If they are tasks to understand, if they are tasks to understand, then what is the Gospel of Mark? Mark is a task. It's designed as a task to find the resolution and therefore the meaning of these parables. Now, it's not just the 12 disciples and those around them. See, there's a group. Now, what's interesting about the gospel is that Jesus selects the people in that inner circle. Hey, you, 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 come on along. You can become fishers of men. So therefore, Jesus selects these people. He sees something about them. Now he has the people, and now he has to instruct them. Now there's a tension now between two words, all right? Instruction. Instruction like he's giving them instruction and preaching or teaching. I'm going to hyphenate that. Preaching, teaching. There is a tension between these two. And it's our job to see whether we can understand that tension. There's a preaching and teaching. This is to the many. This is in the synagogues. Over here in this group, there's a private unfoldment, a private learning, we'll call it, a private learning experience. No one moves from this group to this group. In terms of the story, no one moves from this group to this group. This, this group is therefore selected, pardon me, the private learning group is a selection, pre-selection, but yet there are others who follow these 12, so therefore they, he selects the basic 12 and there's a set of other people that follow. And of course these are the Mary Magdalene, etc., and people like them. Now, I would like to invite you to consider something. 
we can find in this text example after example of the fact that the people at the time, when they're going to hear Jesus preach, they are astonished. They are astonished at what they hear. Again and again and again. They are astonished. They recognize it as a new teaching. <clears throat> People come from miles to hear it. Nowhere do we find anything in the Gospel of Mark that we would call a teaching. If you mean by a teaching that there must be something communicated, if we mean by teaching there is something communicated, some content, that content must be in some way articulated, communicated, in such a way to allow us to understand in some way why it had this tremendous effect on the audience. Nowhere do we find that. What we do find is a couple of occasions where Mark does reveal something about what was taught. And we're going to take a look at these episodes and we'll look at it and we'll say to ourselves, is that a teaching? Or is that a prophecy? Or what is it? And does it meet the condition that will give us an insight into why it is that the people around him found his talks to be not only inspiring but astonishing and amazing? Well, let me go further. Before we get to these two examples, there are three, but interesting. Uh, there's a play of one against another and a third. What is he doing? What is he doing? What is this all about? Now, I'm going to try to create a problem. Here's a teacher who does two things. He goes around the country giving amazing and astonishing teachings or, or preachings. And nowhere in Mark do we have any evidence of what it was that astonished them. He has a private group that he's teaching. And he's teaching them how to understand parables and insists upon the fact that they understand those parables. Which group can get to the kingdom of God? He tells the people the kingdom of God is at hand. The opening lines of Jesus' first talk as he comes out of the baptism with John, John the Baptist, when he emerged from the, the desert, was he tells them, hey, the kingdom of God is at hand. The time is to repent and uh, believe, in the, believe in the gospel. The gospel means good news. Now, why doesn't he say, just repent, and then, then you'll gain the kingdom of God? He doesn't do that at all. They're separate and distinct. He wants these people, the public. He wants, to, he wants to create a deep impression upon them, and he's quite successful in doing it. He raises the issue of the kingdom of God, but what appears to be essential is that you have to be able to understand the parables. There's a connection, therefore, between the parables and the kingdom of God. Now, that makes it an esoteric teaching, a separate group of people giving a private word, private instruction. But then he quickly says right after the 
uh, sower and the seed parable. And he said to them, a lamp is a lamp brought in to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not on a stand. For there's nothing hid except that it be made manifest. Nor is there anything secret except to come to light. If any man has ears, let him hear it. So it makes it quite clear, but then ends with, oh, if you can hear this, if you can understand this, okay, good. If you can't, And he adds, take heed to, to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get. And still more will be given you. For him that has, more will be given. Who has not, even that will be taken away. Now, watch the way on the next quote, why he's, how he's going to link the sower and the seed with the kingdom of God. I'm again in chapter 4. And he said, and he's talking to the inner circle, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He knows not how. The earth produces of itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts it in the sickle because the harvest has come. Then he goes through a whole series of a parables. And I'll just read the first line. Another parable he put before them, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. Next one. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? To what parable shall we use it? Use for it. It's like a mustard seed. Now look here, he's talking to the inner circle and therefore, he's talking about parables, how they are to be understood, and how they are to be linked together so there's an inner connection between the private learning, the private learning of parables and the kingdom of God. They are intimately connected. Well then, if anybody's interested in understanding the Gospel of Mark, they're not going to get far trying to understand the preaching because there's nothing there. Now, what does he do? Well, what he does, of course, gives us a great deal. He gives us case after case of miracles. And in each one of these miracles, it's linked to belief. I'm going to suggest, and I think you're already anticipating it, wouldn't we expect from conventional Christianity that belief is intimately connected with the kingdom of God? No, it's not. It's connected with the miracles. It's not what we expect at all. Now, as this story unfolds, all right. Notice what we said before. We said something strange happens. Not only does he tell parables, but he takes events, events and treats them as parables. Let's see if we can just see that, 6, 7, and 8. Chapter 6, 7, and 8. All right. And uh, beginning of 6, by the way, makes this very point. I'll show, I should read that just in order to make a point. Uh, beginning of 6. And he went away from here and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom given to him? What mighty works are wrought by his hands? We don't hear, however, any line of the wisdom this man is, by, is speaking. What astonished them? We're not given that. What we are given, however, is the mighty works that he has done. Now, let me give an example. Um,
He starts at uh, 614 telling the story of King Herod. References to Elijah, you know the story of King Herod and uh, the fact that his, uh, he took his brother's wife and that upset uh, Herod so badly that uh, when John the Baptist opposed him in that and claimed that he was committing adultery, he got so upset he had him jailed and later killed. Now, therefore we have an episode with Herod in 6. All right, we'll call it the Herod story. Now that goes on for a while, and it ends at uh, 631. And at 632, Jesus then feeds the 5,000. The miracle of feeding 5,000. And of course, he teaches them many things, and we don't uh, discover what he taught them. But again, he talks to his disciples and on the side, and he tells them many things that are going to happen. Then, of course, there's the walking on the water. Well, walking on the water scene. And then quickly after that is the healing at uh, Gennesaret. And um, many are touched and made well. And then, of course, we have the next scene where um, uh, the Pharisees come in there and they object to the fact that Jesus is eating with sinners and not washing his hands. So we have the next, we have the Pharisees. And right after that episode with the Pharisees, the traditional and the real, as it's sometimes called, they object to, the Pharisees object to the way in which the people around Jesus are eating and, and uh, not bathing and not washing before they eat. And he turns to them and he says, uh, hear me all of you and understand. There is nothing outside a man which but going, by going into him can defile him. All the things which come out of a man are what defile him. And when he entered the house, he left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a man from outside cannot defile him since it, since it enters, not his heart, but his stomach? So we have that whole episode exploring, and then we have the uh, Canaanite woman. Uh, there's a brilliant story of the Canaanite woman who one-ups Jesus. And then we have the 4,000 feeding. Again, another major miracle. You, right? Two great eatings, fast, uh, pardon me, feedings. Then the Pharisees seek a sign. I'm on eight now, chapter eight. And of course, Jesus says, no sign will be given to this generation. So we have six, seven, and eight. Now he's going to take all of these together and he's going to treat it as an object for understanding and that requires understanding the interconnection between them. Now they had forgotten, the, the, the disciples forgot to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat and he cautioned them saying, take heed, 
Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Hey, beware of the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees. Therefore, at this point, at the end of 8, he goes back to beware of the leaven of the Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. He's pulling together these two events. Now he's going to pull together these two. And they discussed it with one another, saying, We have no bread. And being aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the, the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said seven. And he said, do you not yet understand? Hey, look what he's doing. He's saying there is something going on in his ministry that you don't take on faith, you don't take it on, on a, a, a great storytelling event. These are objects of understanding. Haven't you understood what's going on? For you have to understand the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. Ah, then he demands that they understand what went on. Now, here they're feeding 5,000. Here he's feeding 4,000. Right after that, they get in a boat. They only, they're going across the, the sea. And uh, they only have one loaf of bread. They ask for bread. They want a miracle. And he says, hey, you see, one of the demands the Pharisees had was, we want you to perform a sign for us now. And he says, hey, there'll be no sign given for this generation. I am not a magician. I am not going to come about and give you a sign to meet your needs. That's not what I'm doing. Therefore, he's telling them the same thing. Don't you understand what just went on? Don't you understand what went on? So all through this work now, we see the role of understanding. Even in major events, he links them together and demands that they understand it as a unity. In this section, there are eight explicit references to understanding just in this section. Again, 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 again. Now, what does this, where does this go? And of course, Jesus then enters the question of who am I, and the, 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 the many titles come up. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Here's where we get an example of what he teaches them, but not what he teaches the many in the synagogues or out in the fields other than parables. And uh, that's what I wanted to do here. And... I was going to delay it again. No, I'll do it now, okay, because I want to go somewhere with it. He called to them, the, he, he called, called to him the, his disciples, and he said to them, um, no, pardon me, it precedes that. Um, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, four things be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Four points. Peter objects to it and they have that get behind me Satan episode. Now, at uh, 9.30, uh, again, we have the second teaching, the second example of this teaching. And he went on from there and passed through Galilee and he would not have anyone know it for he was teaching his disciples saying to them now we have it again explicit teaching them ah, ah not parables teaching them the son of man will be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and when he's killed after three days he will arise but they did not understand again they didn't understand they don't understand what's going on when he gives this teaching. They are different, these are different. These two stories are, are, are amazingly different. 
There is a similarity between them, but the differences are worth noting. Uh, in the first, right, uh, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed after three days, be rise again. In 930, it is, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men, and the men will kill him, and when he is killed, after three days he will arise. That says it's different. It's, the first one is the Pharisees, the scribes, right? Very explicit groups. The second time he says, no, 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 no. He'll be delivered to men. Now, I want to return to that because uh, it's a very interesting thesis, and I'm going to call it uh, collectively the three days, all right? After three days. Just in passing, uh, it is very important to know that in the Nag Hammadi discovery of the Gnostic texts, not only are they those magnificent Gospels that they discovered, including the Gospel of Thomas, but there are several tractates, and in those tractates there are several that mention the resurrection as a spiritual event and not a physical event. And if you want to get in touch with me, I can give you the references to that later. All right, now, here we have this buildup then. Six, seven, eight. Understand, 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 understand. Now, this can now be seen, therefore, as he treats events as if they're parables and he demands that they be understood. That's what we wanted to show. Therefore, at nine, At night, we have the great transfiguration. This is the truly great event. Now, you see, most people who read the Gospel of Mark and Christians put all the emphasis on the Easter, the resurrection of Christ. Right? This is the resurrection. But if that wasn't there for the first 400 years, then, architectonically, as a piece of art, you would then focus on this as the great centerpiece of the work. We have this in our culture, this we miss. This is what should be celebrated, not this. Let's see why. Now, I'd like to go through all of Mark, but we obviously you can't do it in one night. But I would like to um, um, bridge into the great um, transfiguration. Okay, here we go. I'm in 9, 2, 10. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up to a high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became glistening, intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. So out of this transcendent experience, this is an astonishing pure light experience. This is a pure light experience <clears throat> of such intensity that even his clothes glisten as white. And out of that whiteness come Moses and Elijah. That is saying something terribly significant about the nature and the power 
of that divine luminosity. And when it occurred, what did they do? They're talking. Logos, they're talking. That's the great conversation. That's what I call it, the great conversation. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's well that we're here. Let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. No, three booths. The word is tabernacle, right? Three tabernacles. Peter says, hey, that's what we should do. We should build three tabernacles. Now, tabernacle, of course, from the, the uh, story of Moses, <clears throat> was created in such a way with such skill as described in the Old Testament because it was to house the Shekinah, as they called it, which is the feminine use of the term, the divine presence. The divine presence is called the Shekinah. That's what, what used to be called the feminine aspect of uh, God in the Old Testament, because Shekinah is feminine. Now, <clears throat> Peter says, wow, we need to build three tabernacles. Then, <clears throat> if that being the case then, they would then have Obviously, it's not a rejection of Moses. They would still have the tabernacle of Moses. And now they would have three others. One for Moses, one for Jesus, and one for Elijah. Now, what does Jesus say to them? No? No, no, he doesn't say that at all. Well, a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man should have arisen from the dead. Ah, the three days. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. That's their question. That's what they got out of this. That's what they got out of this interesting episode. Right? What is meant by the rising from the dead? Well, everyone knows what the dead is. It's a, obviously, it means exactly what it says, but they had a peculiar question about it. What does it mean? Because now they're looking at it in an entirely different way. Ah. Now, They had the question, you see, what does this mean? See, three days after, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? That's what he's telling them. That's what the disciples in the inner group are seeing. Now, while he's doing this, it is not fair to say that his disciples were totally confused about what he was doing and they didn't understand him. Well, that's true. It would not be fair because in the beginning of nine, uh, pardon me, in the beginning of six, um, he calls the 12 disciples together and he sends them out without any uh, bread and without any bags and no money to preach to men that they should repent. He preached that men should repent. That's the public teaching. And they cast out many demons anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Hey, they were very skilled, right? Gosh, they, they, uh, uh, exorcism, casting out demons, uh, healing the sick and healing them, and preaching. They're giving a public teaching. They are. No parables. No parables. Therefore, they're very effective they are very effective, they deserve an A grade, but they haven't cracked the mystery of the parables again and again and again. That's the task. Now, the, um, um, 
I would like to um, see if we can um, deal with this curious problem of the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God issue. Right from the beginning, he says, it is at hand. Not in the future, it's at hand. Therefore, what we should try to understand is since the idea of kingdom of God depends upon understanding these parables, it would be interesting, therefore, to try to know what is it that this curious name attaches itself to? What does he mean by the kingdom of God? What is it? Like, what is it? What do you have to do to prepare yourself for it? Who comes close? Who has come close to it? What is it? Who's come close to it? Well, um, especially who can come to it? Um, give an example of the. Uh, it isn't just the disciples. Um, oh, we need a couple of more pieces in here, too. Uh, Okay. Um. Okay. I am in chapter fifteen. The uh, crucifixion is over. Jesus is dead. And when the evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was himself looking for the kingdom of God, therefore it's an idea that was afloat, Here's an Orthodox Jew, well-respected in the community, right? not in the inner circle, a respected member of the council. He too was also looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus. So there we have a very fine example. That you see this idea of kingdom of God is a, a very significant thing. Those people who there are certain people who have a certain state of mind, who have the courage to stand out and to do something decisive, are involved in this quest for the kingdom of God. Now, um, in contemporary religious thought, 
the idea of the kingdom of God is intimately connected with the Son of God theme. Son of God, kingdom of God. It's interesting that the, this early, the early texts of the New Testament, the early testaments that we spoke of, they all agree to this one thing, that the two things, the opening line of the Gospel of Mark, it's very beautiful, of course. It starts out with the uh, famous words, that uh, in the, be uh, the beginning of the gospel of the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? the Son of God. The Son of God is not in the ancient text. It was added some four or five hundred years later. At the end of the story, where he is, Jesus is on the cross, and the centurion, as you know, the last words of the centurion. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he thus breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. However, the early texts all have merely son of God, not the son of God. a son of God, not the son of God. Therefore, there is no assignment from any living being, apart from demons and unclean spirits, of course, that in any way give to the name, uh, give to the character of Jesus the title son of God. It isn't there. That was added. Now, if that's added, we can take it out. We can take it out. We take it out, that helps us, you see, because then that leaves us with a centurion at the end of the story saying, oh, who is he? A son of God? Uh, not the son of God. What does that mean? Well, see, the more mysteries we create about this man and this story, the more we can get close to another interesting and curious thought. And that is, for whom was this written? There's an ancient letter by Papias that reports at the time of uh, uh, the writing of this gospel, that Peter was alive, and he knew Peter, Papias, and he said that uh, uh, Mark studied with Peter, and that what, what Mark did was rearrange the material, though he didn't falsify it, he rearranged it all. That's right, he rearranged it all. Now, we need another case. We need someone who is close to coming close to this interesting state, and we have a couple of good cases called the kingdom of God. And um, let me see if I can get you one. I like one I have here. Um, um, Where did I put the great story of... Uh, I think I should have... I sent... Oh, I sent you out for it. Yeah. May I have that, please? Yeah. What's, what's page two? 249. Ah, 249.
one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well asked him which commandment is the first of all and Jesus said the first is hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and with all your strength the second is you shall love your neighbor as yourself there's no other commandment greater than these the scribe said to him you're right teacher you have truly said that he is one there is no other but he and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one neighbor as oneself is much more than than all the the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices and when Jesus saw that he answered wisely having mind he said to him you're not far from the kingdom of God so let's see now let's see what that means in this example we have an exchange. Right here we have an exchange. Right? The scribe, Jesus says something. Right about the first first commandment, he combines it with the second. The scribe reflects on it, and then the scribe gives his reflection of it. Then Jesus then reflects on this and then concludes. Now, that's a very interesting kind of exchange. It's a testing. It's a testing. So, what I want to focus on is just this rather curious ending. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Well, what is he judging? He's judging these words. Right? He's judging the fact that this scribe asked him something. He's an unusual scribe, confronted, right? Confronted Jesus. So he's also looking, obviously, at his state of mind. He's very attentively examining how he understands what he just said and then he concludes you know what you are not far from the kingdom of you know what that means <laughs> good heavens you know what that means that means the kingdom of God is a state of mind that's what it means it means it's a state of mind that's what he's teaching a state of mind a state of consciousness the kingdom of heaven therefore is a state of mind or a state of consciousness now there must be something therefore that Jesus sees in the scribes answer that says hey you know you are really close you're close you're not far from the kingdom of God therefore if we look at this and look at the differences we might then wonder whether or not those differences constitute what could be called separation from a state of mind, uh, a degree of difference in consciousness between a pure state and that state in which he was in. Let's go back. What did the scribe say? He says, you're right, teacher. You've said that he is one, and there's no other but he. He added that, no other, no other than he. Well, that is a way of understanding one, no other. So in that sense, it's adding to it positively. And to love him with all the heart, same thing. And with the understanding. And um, I just had a colleague of mine just check 
uh, again with a friend of mine and, and their understanding of the Greek. And the understanding here indicated is a higher sense of the word, right? Soon, nuo, nuios, which means union, a coming together, a quick comprehension, uh, uh, an intelligence. Is that what that means? It's coming to. He's looking. He's saying, "You know what? I'll tell you what it is. It's a quick coming together. It's a. It's an insight. That's right. It's, it's an insight. Right. You have to do that with your whole intuitive faculty." That's adding to what Jesus said. He just said dianoia, which is understanding. Therefore, it could be positive. And with all the strength to love one neighbor as oneself, same thing. But he adds, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's what he added. is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And is much more than all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's what he's comparing it with. Right? He's comparing the basic commandments, right, the one that was just articulated. Right? He said when you put that in a scale, a weighing scale, right? Put that in a weighing scale. Then this first and second commandment, right? it's far, right? far more. It's much more than all the, the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, he answered. When he saw that, he answered. It's not a place comparison. Of course it is. It's a trivial remark. It's out of place compared with the one, compared with loving, compared with all your strength. It says, you know what, you're close. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Therefore, look here. Suppose we will then say, Suppose we go back into the text and find every place where they talk about the kingdom of God. Line up all the parables and see whether or not they're focusing on the need to understand the kind of understanding that can bring about a more significant state of mind. Well, if that's the case, you see, then for whom is this written? Then we can answer our first question about why doesn't Mark tell us about the great speeches that he gave in the synagogues? Because they're not necessary. They're beside the point. Totally. This is the real issue, the unfoldment of the mind of man on such a profound level that we can say, therefore, it deserves a title. And the title is a strange title because it's the kingdom of God. And therefore, it isn't something that will come, it's not something that happens at the end of the world. Now, there is a further, let's go to the next further difficulty here. I think we can have some fun with this. While this is going on with great understanding and great artful construction, there is something that's going on that brings about the tragedy. And the tragedy is in this question of just what is Christ? What is the Messiah? You see, this word Christ, Messiah, can go in two directions. It can either be a spiritual Right? A spiritual Christ, Son of God. Son of God is a state of mind. Kingdom of God, that's a spiritual. Or it can take on the political. When it takes on the political, 
That's when he is sometimes called the son of David. Son of David means he's in the lineage of kings and therefore would pose a political threat to the rule of Jerusalem and the rule of the Holy Land by the Roman Empire. It's because of this that he is finally brought to trial. Are you or are you not a political leader? If you are, that's an insurrection because to claim you're the son of David means you're in that lineage and you seek to become king of the Jews. Now, why didn't he repudiate that? Why didn't he repudiate that? Very simply. Why didn't he say, by the way, uh, there's some concern about me being uh, a Messiah, the son of God, or being in the house of David, let me clarify it. My 12 people, the people that are with me, are not carrying anything that looks like martial weapons. They are not out for political control of any state. They're out for the control of their own state of mind. He doesn't, because in his thinking, in his thinking, he does see the difference, but he doesn't make that difference clear. Because he doesn't make it clear, the drama unfolds. That's the Achilles heel. In every tragedy, that's the mark of a tragedian. The fundamental figure of a tragedian is someone obviously of great significance, great standing, and because of some blindness, some foolish thing that he should have done or should have seen, he doesn't, and therefore follow the consequences of a tragic dimension. That's, of course, Aristotle. If that's the case, then this work is designed as a tragedy. Now, there are many thinkers in today's world, and I'd recommend one who gives it to you, Hengel, who did a very fine study showing that the basic structure of the Gospel of Mark fits classically the five divisions of a Greek tragedy, and especially its, its uh, architecture with its central feature in the middle, the fact that there is one slight error in the thinking of the major figure, some blind spot that brings about his fall, and that we, therefore, can participate in it and see the tragedy and can learn from it. But here we can learn from two things. We can learn what all tragedies tell us, that therefore you must make clear certain things, you must see certain things at your own expense if you don't. But it tells us this other thing, that there's something far more significant going on, a religious drama dealing with more complex and profound states of mind. Now, he does make it clear. He rejects the title. But the way he does it, he puts it in terms that are not clear to the average reader, but he does make it clear, and because he didn't make it any clearer, so the story comes about the way it did. At 1235, and as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that Christ, the Christ, is the son of David? David himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put thy enemies under thy feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? It is not obvious. You have to see behind that story that what that essentially is saying, that how can, he, how, can, how can he be a son of God or how can anyone be a son of God sitting at the right-hand side of God? And if God does all the work, there'll be no role for his, his position and, uh, uh, and therefore he would be without a spiritual mission. But that's pretty complex and it also comes out of the 110 Psalms. But in any case, he does deal with it in this rather strange way, and therefore the perplexity continues. In one last section, when he's asked, who are you? And uh, by the, in the end, the, the, the great statement, uh, who do you say you are? Um, there is some difficulty, of course, Pilate asks him. Um, I'd like to just get that one section. Um, just before the king of the Jews, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Um, uh, 
The high priest, okay, here we are. Okay. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Silent, made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you Christ, the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seating, seated at the right hand <clears throat> of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. That is, I am, you will see the Son of Man, not the Son of God. So, I wanted to therefore conclude by saying, this work is designed <clears throat> very skillfully in such a way that it draws the reader in as a challenge to understand it, like a Greek tragedy. You're in the audience. You're getting all of the pieces. You have to be drawn into it to see the value of expressing what you see as the challenge. And obviously, the highest challenge then would be to unveil that state of mind called the kingdom of God. Now, there are many things we left out called the great what, what sometimes is called the Dharma combats and the, con the consequences of the interactions between many figures in the story, but I think we've reached enough at this point to call it. Therefore, quickly, thank you. Questions? <laughs> Louder? Yeah. Huh? Nothing right now. I would say one thing, okay? I would say any Christian who's really a Christian from Mark should take down all of their Easter material and put up three tabernacles. That's where it goes. The real Christian symbol should be the three tabernacles, Moses, Jesus, and Elijah. Now, Elijah was the restorer, the great restorer who justifies things, who restores. And that's part of this vision, to restore the earth, to restore it. Moses, the great lawgiver. So we need law. We need law. We need far-seeing law. We need a restoration of mankind. And we need a religious figure who can bring about the state of mind necessary among mankind so that they can be led out of their folly. That's the whole issue, I think, in Christianity. Therefore, we need the three tabernacles. Let's see if we can get a couple of people to build them. Thank you. Is that, is this the idea, that, is that the idea of the new covenant that you mentioned? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Let me even mention that. Yes, thank you for, uh, at um, um, Mark 14. Um, 14.22, he says, you know, uh, he, that's at the, the great uh, Last Supper. And uh, he took of the wine. Truly I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Right? So let me read it again. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. New covenant. He has a new binding agreement with mankind is what he's reaching for. And it includes those three great spirits, Moses, Elijah, and this new idea, and it is a new covenant, to reach a higher and more profound state of mind than that which we normally are conscious of. That should be the three tabernacles. So with the law, the restoration, and the new leader, they're still, it's still not presenting a concept of, um, of repentance and being saved, really? Or? Well, you see, yes, quite true. Um, th there's still the issue, which I didn't cover fully, but I, I can. Uh, at another time. Restoration of a sense of repentance. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not to reach the kingdom of God is, it is not sufficient merely to repent. Right from the beginning. Right? Because in the very beginning, um, um, the first talk that he has, the first public talk he has, um,
Mark says, um, um, at 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. So it's repentance that by itself is not sufficient. And the good news is that there's the kingdom of God. So it's obviously an important feature, but it's not sufficient. Ah, sneaked under the line, rushed through, try to bring it together. <laughs>